this webinar brought to you by Orchard Technologies. Orchard Technologies is a global leader in oral fluid substance abuse testing products. The e-cafes provide accurate and easy to administer testing methods to help determine the presence or absence of drugs or alcohol in a person's system. Fluid-based testing products provide a simplified collection process that results with minimal risk of tampering and dramatically reduced risk of adulteration. The oral fluid drug test is an FDA-cleared laboratory-based oral fluid drug testing system that enables accurate testing for nine drugs of abuse, including marijuana, cocaine, PCP, amphetamines, methamphetamines, barbiturates, bilodiazepine, methadone, and opiates. Ranked as the number one recognized brand name in oral fluid testing in a 2015 National Drug Testing Industry Survey. With its an easy to administer collection process, Intercept is ideal for workplace, criminal justice, treatment centers, and clinical setting screening programs, among others. Today's presentation is entitled Workplace Coatening Testing in legal, is Illegal, Affordable, and Becoming Popular, and will be presented by Bill Curran and Mindy Pierce. Kurt is the president of the Current Consulting Group, a national consulting firm that specializes in drug testing policy development and helping employers optimize their employee screening program. The editor of the online Ultimate Guide to State Drug Testing Laws at statedrugtestinglaws.com. He also publishes the e-newsletter State Drug Testing Laws Monthly. Mr. Kurt is the former executive director of the American Council for Drug Education and served as vice president of consulting for a national third party Administrator of Drug Testing and Background Screening Services. He is the author or co-author of 10 books on substance abuse issues, including Why Drug Testing. He administers the annual drug testing industry study now in its 17th year. He is the Director of Life Work Strategies for Advanced Health Care. Advanced Health Care, founded in 1907, is the first and largest health care work space in Montgomery County, Maryland, and largest provider of charity care, Community benefits. Life Strategies delivers integrated wellness and behavioral health services to employees regionally and nationally. Minders currently develops and implements the strategic plan for employee assistance programs and employee health and wellness programs in support of advanced health care, then for health and high performing workplace. Mrs. Koo's background includes commercial fitness center management and corporate wellness program development. She holds the Certified Exercise Physiologist Certification from the American College of Sports Health Sports Medicine. Mrs. Koo works creatively with advanced health care subject matter experts, service providers, and organization leadership to ensure that interventions appropriately address client employees along the health continuum and ultimately reduce modifiable health risk, enhance work-life strategies, reduce health plan costs, and improve productivity employee satisfaction. It will be our pleasure to hear from Bill Curran and Mindy Beard. Well, Thika, and welcome to everyone who has joined today's webinar. I'm very pleased to be presenting today with Mindy. Uh, she'll take the second part of today's presentation. I'll take the first part, and then after uh, Mindy, then the two of us will talk a little bit about the center at hand. And of course, today we're talking a little bit about um, smoking and uh, testing for nicotine, and more specifically, testing for coating. And we'll go into an explanation of the sort of the technical terms as well. But the backdrop for today presentation is the fact that smoking is a very dangerous habit to have and a very costly one. Over $190 billion annually lost productivity and increased health care expenditures. So as we go through today's presentation, we're going to talk about the things that you should consider if you're planning to develop a coating testing program and then how the various state laws and smoker rights laws can affect what you do in workplace or other other type of organization in terms of um, prohibiting smoking and uh, testing workers for coatening. And specifically, uh, we'll talk about the advantages of oral fluid testing for coatening as an option to uh, maybe urine testing that uh, many companies may be more used to, but seeing oral fluid testing as an option. And so when we get through today's presentation, We'll, we'll have covered sort of the technical aspects of uh, detecting coatening as a metabolite.
metabolite of nicotine and why that's an advantage versus simply testing for nicotine. Um, the windows of detection for the one, the, um, um, the, the, the time it takes to conduct a test, the, the process of actually collecting a sample, getting a lab result, and that type of stuff. And then, you know, the different ways in which you might have a codeine testing program. Maybe do it as part of a wellness program. Maybe your screen job applicants or employees who are, who are promoting into new positions. Maybe it's part of a corporate sustain program that you're offering um, as part of wellness fair, et cetera. There's lots of different ways where you could, you could conceive and implement a codeine testing program. And, it, and oral fluid testing creates an option for HR professionals that in, in many cases can be quite in terms of the costs that are involved and the process of actually getting a result and, and having a least sensible result, and and sort of sort of set the stage. I'm going to talk about some of the latest statistics, and uh, as I mentioned, the state law. We're also going to talk a little bit about the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, which has some aspects in it that touch on uh, programs like uh, well, various wellness pro programs, of course, but smoking cessation programs, codeine testing, things of that nature. And then we'll we'll we'll, we'll talk about the advantages of oral fluid codeine testing. Mindy's going to talk a little bit from sort of the real-world perspective of, of being somebody who manages such a program, and, and she'll have a unique perspective on all of this. Now, we present this information not as somebody having experience as a smoker. I've never smoked uh, in my entire life, and I'm grateful for that, of course. At any age, it, it could be a very challenging uh, half break, uh, as it could be for anybody, right? But it's also very costly. The average smoker smokes between 13 and 16 cigarettes a day, which my understanding is that somewhere could be as many as four to six packs a week, uh, and the cost is about $1,500 a year. But in some parts of the United States, like in New York City, a pack of cigarettes is a lot more expensive than in other parts of the country, between $11 and $13 for a pack. So that, that means that, that the average annual expenditure for somebody in New York City is quite a bit more than the average smoker nationwide, if you, you kind of put it together. And as I mentioned, costs associated with, with smoking to society overall is over $90 billion. That's $97 billion in lost productivity, $96 billion in health care expenditures, and I'm going to break that down for you here in a couple of slides. So they have an interest. They have a vested interest in employing workers who don't smoke, creating incentive programs to motivate smokers to stop smoking, uh, et cetera. And some of that's built into the Affordable Care Act, uh, and some of it's done by company by company choice. It's a wellness program, as I mentioned. But it could be, you know, codeine testing could be part of a, a screening program or a way of uh, holding uh, workers honest, so to speak, when it comes to what they're really not smoking anymore. Let's, let's break it down into some interesting statistics. And let me, as I go through this, you know, we're, we'll go to the statistics a little bit quickly. So don't worry about taking notes. We're going to send out a link to today's slide presentation to and who's on the call. So if you're on the call today, and we have a lot of people on today, you're going to get a link not only to the recording of today's presentation, but to the slide deck that I'm taking you through. Um, so all of these statistics will be at your fingertips within, say, 48 hours of, of today's presentation. Cigarette, cigarette smoke contains thousands of chemicals which are to cause cancer. Smoke is directly responsible for about 90% of lung cancer deaths and between 90% of emphysema and chronic bronchitis deaths. So the question about smoking cigarettes is bad. The majority of, uh, of uh, smokers, and, and I've got a slide coming up, but I'm not exactly sure where it is. Let me just say it while it's in, in, in the top head here. About 17 to 18 percent of adults 18 and older in the United States are smokers. Now, the good news is that's down considerably over about a five-year period um, when it was down 22, 23 percent. Now it's down, you know, we're in the neighborhood of 4 to 5 percent overall. So that's the good news. Of course, the bad news is a lot of people still smoke. That percent of smokers started uh, smoking regularly at the age of 18 or younger, and 86% at 21 and younger. And then among current smokers,
worst chronic lung disease, as you see here in the third bullet, accounts for about 73% of smoke-related conditions. And we're all in the same room together, and I ask for a show of hands. Many of us would be able to raise our hands. Unfortunately, um, if I were to ask you how many of us uh, know anyone who has died of lung cancer, for example, how many of us know a smoker who died of lung, lung disease of some sort? Uh, any of us, of course, would raise our hands because that is one of the leading uh, negative consequences of long-term smoking. Um, and among those who quit smoking, there are a significant percentage that still suffer from different kinds of chronic lung disease. And an example, my father, unfortunately, died at the age of 61. He was a lifetime smoker. 61, obviously, is a very young age to die. He died as a direct result of um, contracted cancer from even years of smoking. Her, on the other hand, who, thank God, still alive today, she's 85, it's almost 86, uh, stopped smoking about 25, well, not, actually closer to 30 years ago, through a corporate cessation program that was offered where, where she worked. She tells the story all the time. She was on her way home from a vacation, and she heard on the radio a news report that the, the, the price of a Cigarettes in California, where she lived, was going up to whatever the price was at the time, and she said, "No, oh, that's enough. I'm I'm not spending that kind of money on on sick anymore." And so, when she went back to work, they were offering a cessation program through her employment that she was able to participate in, and she's never smoked since then. Now she may have, you know, suffered some kind of consequences of my father, uh, and she continued to smoke, but but, but smoking. Uh, over the last 25, 30 years, um, she's still alive, and, and we're thankful for that. But if we're all in the same room together and I ask for a show of hands, unfortunately many of us would raise our hands because we know people who suffered from different types of smoking-related diseases and illnesses and maybe even death. And in the last bullet, their smoking harms nearly every organ in the body. The main cause of lung cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, et cetera, et cetera. So very tough. Few statistics on this page that, that you know maybe you didn't know the numbers, but you knew the facts sort of behind the numbers. There's a cost as well when it comes to smoking, and this sort of you know, factors into the cost of doing business, right? A smoker costs a private employer in the U.S. about five thousand eight hundred sixteen dollars a year compared to their non-smoking coworkers. A well, the university did a study; they estimated that the largest smoking-related cost Three thousand seventy-seven dollars. I got it right there in red, so you don't miss it. Annually, per employee who smokes, came from taking cigarette breaks or smoking breaks. The so smoker takes five a day compared to typically three breaks for uh, workers. You maybe a morning break, a lunch break, and an afternoon break. But if you work with smokers, if you're a smoker, you know that you may be stepping out uh, at least a couple of extra times a day uh, to go outside of your office or your place of employment to smoke. And that costs money. If you add all up, the average smoker is costing his or her employer an extra 3000 plus a year from taking extra smoking breaks. The largest cost of just over $2,000 was related to excess health care expenses. Now, I've done a lot of research on statistical reports, studies, um, surveys, etc. I've done this my entire career in the drug testing field. And um, I know that, that you can statistics kind of say whatever you want them to say. But the true matter is that if you're a smoker, over the course of time, you will cost your employer more money than a non-smoker in certain aspects of employment. Okay? As you see in the bullet, tend to be absent from work more often. I don't know exactly why that is. Maybe it's taking care of medical expenses, things of that nature, being sick more often, and et cetera. But an aspect of lost productivity that's associated with increased absenteeism from smoking, just like there is, you know, lots of studies that show that there's a significant increase in absenteeism from drug users compared to non-drug users, and so the same sort of applies. Now, nicotine is the ingredient in cigarettes that typically is blamed for causing addiction. You become addicted. To nicotine. And as you see in that first bullet, the smoker is not only physically addicted, but becomes sort of mentally 
psychologically addicted because smoking gets linked in your mind to certain social activities. And those social activities, when you're in such a social activity, like maybe being out at a at a at a, a, a place where people can smoke and where everybody's smoking, that triggers the impulse to smoke. And so the addiction is compounded not only by the physical addiction but also by the psychological addiction that's associated with social activities that trigger smoking. And there's studies more current than 2009, but in 2009, nearly 50 million adults were former smokers. And of the 46.5 million current adult smokers, 6% stopped smoking at least one day in the previous year. They, they just stopped smoking unsuccessfully. And that's trying to do it on their own, not taking advantage of different uh, cessation programs uh, that I'm going to share with you here in a minute and describe for you. Quitting often requires multiple efforts, as you see in the third bullet. There's, there's, there's difference of helps that are available, counseling, there's cation. Uh, they increase the potential for success in a quit attempt. Uh, sometimes when you combine counseling and medication, it, uh, it uh, increases the chances of success even more. And there are a number of medications that have been approved by the FDA to help people stop smoking. Uh, such as nicotine patches, gauzes, as you see in that fourth bullet, nasal sprays and inhalers. And for some people, the, the, those, those different types of medication products will work. For others, they don't work. Um, whole group and telephone text counseling, as you there in the last bullet, has been effective for some people. Young people in particular do everything by with their, their cell phone. And sometimes texting counseling uh, is effective with people who are used to communicating in the world that way as well, and that can be used in conjunction with other programs. Here's one called Kick Butts 2.0. You can go online and find more information, but it's a it's essentially a program that, that sends text messages uh, over a scheduled period of uh, period of time, various intervals over a six month period of time, to you know sort of remind the use the smoker to put ideas into their minds to give them you know, behavioral skills uh, reminders and training to sort of drop the impulse to smoke or to overcome the impulse to smoke and I'm not advocating this particular program but it is one of many that are out there um, and and sometimes employers will make these things known to their employees now my mother She's still alive. She's not been smoking for nearly 30 years now. And it does, once somebody stops smoking, it does slow down whatever rate damage they were doing to their body. So it lowers the risk of lung and other types of cancer. Uh, it reduces the risk of coronary heart disease, stroke, and peripheral vascular disease, etc., as you see in the second um, bullet. But bullet, smoking syndrome. So when you stop smoking, it reduces respiratory symptoms like coughing, wheezing, stress of breath, some of the things that you, you see or, or notice as the physical outward manifestations uh, of a smoker. The red line in lung function is slower for people who quit smoking than those who continue this. And that was the point I was trying to make up there around the first or second bullet in the slide, is that you know certain things have been in motion by 20, 30 years of smoking, but that, that pace starts to slow down once you're not smoking. You may have done some damage uh, that's going to require medical attention at some point. The rate at which or the pace at which that damage continues to, to take uh, a toll on the individual slows down once the individual has stopped smoking. Now, let's skip ahead to state laws. This is an important area of, of, of discussion because there are a lot of people who think, think that 10 workers for cotinine or nicotine is illegal. There's only a state in the entire country that does not allow place testing for cotinine slash nicotine, and that's South Carolina. It's illegal in the other states. The other 49 states, uh, with with various provisions or conditions, allows workplace testing, testing of applicants and employees for nicotine or, or cotinine. There are laws that you have to be aware of. There are smoker rights laws. There are private laws. There's what we call law activity statutes. And of course, there's the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. So the, the question is, 
what can an employer do when someone tests positive? If you're going to do the testing, you need to be aware of these laws. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Colorado, for example, I'm going to read this right out of the law. It wouldn't make sense to summarize it for you, but this is part of their lawful activities law. It shall be discriminatory or unfair employment practice for an employer to eliminate the employment of the employee due to that employee's engaging in any lawful activity, and here's the key, off the premises of the employer during non-working hours unless such a restriction, and I'll read A and B, it's smarter than this if you read the actual statute, A says, relates to a bona fide occupational requirement or is reasonably and rationally related to the employment activities and responsibilities of a particular employee or a particular group of employees rather than all, to all employees or the employer. Or B, is necessary to avoid a conflict of interest with any responsibilities to the employer or the appearance of such a conflict of interest. Now, take a, just a slight detour, it will only take a minute, but these lawful activities laws exist in virtually every state. And as it does, it prohibits an employer from discriminating against somebody who participates in a lawful activity away from work when they're not, you know, working. It's on working hours. Smoke is lawful under most circumstances in every state. You can't smoke in certain public places, of course, and it's technical, technically illegal to smoke under a certain age. So it's a lawful activity away from the workplace during non-working hours. But employers may still have a justifiable reason for testing people who smoke and holding them responsible. For example, if somebody is in some type of an incentive-based program, health program, where um, maybe they're qualifying for a lower health care premium because they're non-smokers. And so they may away from the workplace, participate in a lawful activity, but they're breaking covenant, if you will, they've made with their employer. Now, here I'm going to take the same said in Colorado in particular for marijuana. Marijuana has been legalized for a purpose, not just medical marijuana, but recreational marijuana, or, or so-called recreational marijuana. That's the use of marijuana is legal in the state of Colorado. It's a lawful activity. But so far, the courts have held that Lawful activities laws, which apply in a state, they're state laws, they're not federal laws, they're state laws, can apply to something that's illegal under federal law. And while marijuana has been legalized in Colorado, it is technically, literally, still illegal under federal law. And so the courts of Colorado technically can't create a law or support a law that is in conflict with federal law. Just thought I'd point that out. Same true in Illinois, which is a little bit different as you see, subsection C of this section, it shall be unlawful for an employer to refuse to hire or discharge an individual, uh, otherwise disadvantage any individual respect to compensation terms, conditions, or privileges of employment because the individual uses lawful products off the premises of the employer during non-working hours. Worded just a little bit different in Illinois, but essentially the same meaning. Minnesota. Mississippi, a slight little change here. It shall be unlawful for any public or employer. So they're very specific, public meaning government entities, private meaning the private work, the private uh, work, workplace. Employer is a condition of employment that any employer or applicant for employment abstain from smoking or using tobacco products during non-working hours. Again, there's a workaround on that. But in Mississippi, they passed a law that, that is very specific to smoking or using tobacco products, like, you know, chewing tobacco, et cetera. Okay, let's talk codeine testing and the advantages of oral fluid testing as we progress toward the second half of our presentation and Mindy's part. Nicotine, as I mentioned, is, is the ingredient in cigarette smoke that causes addiction. It's the so active ingredient in cigarettes, okay? In the same case, THC is the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana, but nicotine is the psychoactive ingredient ingredient in cigarettes, and it's the, it's the component that we can blame for the addiction that many people experience when they become smokers. Codeine, on the other hand, is a major metabolite. It's the metabolic breakdown of nicotine, and it's used as a test of choice to evaluate tobacco use or exposure to tobacco because able and, and, this is key, is only produced when nicotine is metabolized. In other words, Cotinine won't be in somebody's system if they've been smoking 
because it is a metabolic breakdown. It's a component, a metabolic component of and only present when nicotine has been metabolized. Okay, that's what we test for codeine rather than simply for nicotine. I've got another slide coming up on that. So the prints of codeine in somebody's system, the study tells us that they've been using tobacco products or they've been exposed to tobacco smoke. It, it's not a test for somebody's health, okay? You can't, you know, base certain decisions on a codeine test result uh, and, and claim that the test result from a codeine test says this person's healthy or not healthy, et cetera. It does, however, if the person's been smoking because if codeine is present, the nicotine's present, and nicotine, of course, comes from smoking. Now, the next slide here. It's codeine testing in a variety of different circumstances. Like we talked about early on, smoking cessation programs as an important screening program, evaluations of applicants' health or insurance policies. Okay, not valuation of health, but for a health or life insurance policy and health and wellness program in different types of incentives that you might have as part of such a program. Now, codeine, we're talking about oral fluid testing for codeine. Okay, but codeine test based on a blood sample, a urine sample, or a sample in addition to saliva. Okay, oral fluids interchangeable with saliva, even though there is technically, scientifically, a difference between the two, but I'm using the two terms interchangeably. Other testing methods, and of course, in fact, most scientists will tell you, blood is the gold standard for detecting anything within the human body. Now, I don't know that that's always true, but in the world of drug testing and codeine testing. However, other types of samples like blood, urine, and hair are complex, and they typically require the services of a professional biometric professional, okay, a professional biometric service provider. And you will not take place, though could, but won't necessarily take place at the work site. It could. It will usually take place at an off-site, auc health center, laboratory, et cetera. <clears throat> the saliva-based test is that they're, they're very simple to administer. You're not asking for anybody's blood. So you're not, you know, putting needle in anybody. You're not asking for urine, which requires certain types of privacy uh, protocols to be put in place, et cetera. Um, and you're not snipping off anybody's hair, which for the follically challenged, such as myself, that can that can be that can be uh, troublesome. Okay, saliva-based tests, base tests are very easy to, to administer, and can be conducted by employees that have been trained to administer the test. One of the more recent and noteworthy uh, uh, um, developments in the drug testing world is that the federal government had last year in May released or published proposed lines for lab-based oral fluid drug testing of federal employers. So federal agencies um, will in the near future, once these proposed guidelines are finalized, which should be somewhere around March, April time frame this year, will be allowed to now test or at that point test for drugs using lab-based oral fluid testing technology. Oral fluid testing is very steadily becoming a viable option to employers in the drug testing world as well as in the world of doing codeine testing or manufacturers a lab-based codeine test for urine, serum, and oral fluid samples. The slide elected with the specimen, the specimen uh, with the collection device and the, and the device with the sample is screened at a laboratory. So you're getting a lab-based result with the or sure uh, testing method. The other testing methods they also offer instant result testing. And I point that out in the sense that Orsher offers these because they're our, our co-sponsor for today's presentation. Um, but the technology is what I'm really pointing to. There's last oral fluid codeine testing and there's instant oral fluid codeine testing. Now, <clears throat> the test, the window of detection, is about four to seven days after tobacco use. It's expensive, non-invasive, of course, you know, compared to the election methods that I talked about. One of the things that comes out of the drug testing world but applies here to codeine testing as well is that every collection is observed. There's no opportunity for somebody to tamper with a, a test. There's no opportunity for an employee who's administering the test to switch it or tamper with it either. The collector and the donor are face-to-face -face during the entire collection process. So the entire collection of a specimen 
is 100% observed. Okay. And <clears throat> well, and let me just point there's a great location for more sure. It's a frequent questions uh, brochure. They can email the uh, PDF version of that booklet to you if you have a lot of questions about it. I found it fascinating the amount of detail and type of questions that went into it. I tell you though about the, the difference in window of detection in for nicotine versus code. The window of detection for nicotine, if you're doing a nicotine um, test, is just a matter of hours, probably two hours if you're only testing for nicotine. However, if you're testing for the metabolism of nicotine, codeine, the window of detection is several days. Detect whether somebody's been smoking for almost up to a week from the time you last smoked. If you're testing with nicotine, you're really only looking at a couple of hours. It's uh, akin to a drug test, I mean an alcohol test, where <clears throat> alcohol will go through a urine sample very, very quickly. Um, codeine, however, the, the met metabolic breakdown of nicotine will stay in the system and be detectable at around a 30 nanogram per milliliter cutoff level uh, for up to several days. And so here you see the picture of the or oral specimen collection device. But I want to emphasize that what you're looking at here is a lab-based test. Okay, it's going to give you an instant test. The collection process just takes a couple of minutes. But like with a lab-based drug test, you're looking at getting a result probably, you know, within 24 hours, let's say. I know it says available within 24 hours. Usually, you know, you who do drug testing know that you'll get a result the next morning after you send it in and it'll be technically 12 hours or 18 hours later, <clears throat> but say within 24 hours. Um, and depending on how important the term time and the result is to you, if you have the, the time to wait till the next the next afternoon to get the result back, you're going to get a lab-based result, which is, which is often very viable, very stable, especially in some area here where somebody's it might be on the line or or somebody's health care premium costs might be affected by the result. There are instant result devices out there. This is the ice cream oral fluid coating test. Get the results in about 10 minutes from this. Uh, you may want to um, uh, confirm it in a laboratory, depending on what type of adverse employment action might result from the from the test. Uh, but you're and you're not going to have the same window of detection with an instant test as you see the second to last bullet. Window of detection of about two days, the shelf 24 hours for uh, for the uh, from the date of manufacture, 24 months, excuse me. Um, but the relation to the laboratory result is excellent, 99% on the specificity and 90% on the sensitivity. So the the quality and the accuracy of the result from this test is very, very similar to the lab result. You're not going to have the same window of detection, but you're going to have an instant result that you can then use. This is just one laboratory's experience here. Um, South Tories over a five-year period, total number of tests conducted on that top line, the number of positives, and the percent of positives. And you can see it, it fluctuated considerably from 2011 at 13.9% to 0.8% a couple of years ago. Uh, as I talked to the folks at Southwest Laboratories about these results, um, and how do with the types of clients that they were doing this testing for and under what circumstances. And also the 2014 figures was only part of the year. So kind of interesting stuff there. So we've talked about sort of the, the general statistics of the magnitude of the problem, the effect that it has on health, the cost of smoking to society and to the workplace. We've talked specifically about cotinine testing. We know that cotinine is a metabolic um, you're going to want to you're going to want to test for for um, excuse me for cotiny to get that type of result, um, and you've got a window of detection. Now, what we're microphone over to Mindy. I'm going to put her slides up on the screen, and I'm going to pass her the, the ball so they can advance the slides. And then the two of us will come back together after. This. Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Mindy Pierce, um, and I am the Director of LifeWorks Strategies. Strategy. 
uh, we are um, a member of Adventist Healthcare, and I'll give you a little bit, uh, a little bit more um, in addition to what you all saw in the beginning. Um, so Adventist Healthcare, we're in Gaithersburg, Maryland. We have five hospitals locally. Uh, we are faith-based, not-for-profit, um, and, and what's interesting about Adventist Healthcare is we are more than 100 year, years old. We're based upon the Seventh-day Adventist principles of wellness, and you know hospitals are generally seen as places where very ill go for treatment for serious conditions. But in the era of all the new health care reform, hospitals and health systems now are being asked to not only just provide the quality and compassionate care inside the hospitals, but to also encourage people to stay healthy and provide communities with resources that encourage a culture of wellness. So LifeWorks Strategies, as a part of Adventist Healthcare, we work with um, integrated data-driven wellness and behavioral health solutions to lawyers. We work really in the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area, and we have many uh, locations that are also located nationwide. So that's how LifeWorks Strategies uh, has come about and why we are part of Adventist Healthcare um, and how it works. We like how we are life work instead of what you hear of the typical uh, back, uh, word work life because we feel life should come first. So part of that is what happens with um, their with their employees' lives and with the people that you touch, and um, how we can affect them um, in a positive way at their work. So life work strategies, in addition to the um, the behavioral health system programs and some wellness programs, we do have some tobacco cessation programs. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the options are and a little bit of what we offer, but also what you can what you can explore for other options for yourselves, and also give you a real life example of how life work strategies. For our own population of Adventist Healthcare, 6,200 employees, what we have put in place related to tobacco cessation policies. There are three main um, points of note that you can think of when we need to put a tobacco cessation program in place. One is clinical counseling, and Bill uh, noted one particular text counseling option. Um, we have clinical counselors here that are available telephonically or in person to be able to conduct um, clinical event. And we work together with our hospital um, clinicians so that the people that are working with our patients, well, we have them here because they are unfortunately sick, but we may know that they're a tobacco user. So our tobacco cessation specialist will go speak with our patients to be able to help them uh, quit tobacco so that they can get healthy. We use the same methodology and the same um, Tend to be able to deliver to our external customers who may not be in our hospitals because we clearly want to prevent them from getting in the hospitals. So clinical counseling programs are extremely effective. Group programs are also another area that you can explore. Mostly because they are, uh, there's a lot of power in groups. And some people, you, know, you find, look what's happening with Weight Watchers and what group programs have done with that and with the effectiveness that can be done. Same thing when people have resources to lean on each other in addition to the instructor of those group programs. As long as those um, programs are, the content is, again, clinically effective, uh, making sure that they have everything in place for the right kind of cessation um, really set out. A uh, strategy that we use in our, our group counseling programs is setting a quit date in program. So, for example, the people who are coming to the group program really think about, and this is the same in our clinical counseling too, we're not going to say, all right, tomorrow you're stopping your, you're stopping your tobacco use. No, we're going to think about what's best for that person, and we prepare them for their quit date. Uh, so that's kind of an example of how that is a real-life situation. And then, again, pharmaceutical treatment, nicotine replacement therapy is another um, option that they can go. And a lot of health plans do offer free nicotine replacement therapy as part of the health plan benefit. Another way that an employer can affect um, the quality of their workplace is thinking about different policies. Perhaps it's a smoke-free workplace policy where they can't smoke during their work hours or within a certain radius of the workplace, or there is you know, zero tolerance for any sort of tobacco use, whether they even leave the premises, say go to um, a restaurant or to, you know, down the street away from the, the radius, some cigarettes come back and are smelling like uh, tobacco, that would be a violation, that could be a violation if that's in the policy. 
A uh, piece that's really gaining popularity is hiring policies. And uh, as Bill stated earlier, depending on the state, you can or cannot do this. Uh, Maryland, we can. And we are um, implementing, We, as of January 1, that is our new hiring policy where we will not hire tobacco users. And we do. And it's a condition of employment uh, during the recruitment process. Piece that we're really going into a lot is a tobacco surcharge policy. We've been doing that for the past three years here at Adventist Healthcare, um, and it's proven um, helpful as we are a self-funded um, health plan, and we're able to use those funds to be able to drive additional programs. And I'll you what that looks like as well. The Cancer Society has um, produced some corporate gold standard um, qualities that, when you're thinking about what you can do for your for your support of your employees and the creation of your program, thinking about these next couple of slides. The first one is support smoking system through health benefits. So providing coverage for uh, counseling, for example, providing coverage for the pharmaceutical aids like the nicotine replacement therapy, financially supporting multiple quit attempts. So it's very possible that they're going to go through the counseling and it's not going to be successful. If you only allow them to have that um, as a benefit as one time, that's not exactly helping that employee get any farther. So really making sure they have multiple quit attempts, offering smoking cessation information and literature year-round. So not just making it a, a quarterly sort of initiative, but making it part of the culture uh, of the organization as well. Continuing the corporate standard or cessation initiatives, so providing employees incentives to stop smoking. Um, one thing that it can be financially incentive, it can be based on the health plan incentive, whether it's the health plan um, participant and on what their contribution is uh, on their paycheck. It really talks a lot, speaks a lot when they have to have it come out of their paycheck, for example. It would be something even simple like a gift card. People do a lot of things for small incentives. This is a very, very big lifestyle change, though, so you're going to want to think about what that incentive could be. And then putting information on the benefits. If it's a cessation, again, just keeping it in the front, whether it's in the employee lounge or whether it is uh, about at a town hall, making sure that the uh, information is put out there. All of those facts that Bill stated on a lot of his slides are really great facts to get out in front of everyone. A huge uh, impact that that can make if that's not just stated once, but stated multiple times to your organization. And then offer, offer other wellness activities. So letting it not just be your um, really driving that message home, but, but ending it with your other activities that you have going on. So perhaps it is something where you are doing a healthy cooking class, uh, making sure that you're driving people to those other activities so that they're not just constantly thinking how they have to stop smoking, but when they do to maybe replace habits with bad habits and thinking about making their lives better because of that. And with your healthcare system, um, providing initiatives or incentives to encourage physician referrals to cessation services. One thing that we like to do here, um, especially with our health plan, is we, we speak with the health plan um, providers or our physicians that are the most popular physicians on our health plan, and we let them know what the in, what incentive program is and what the uh, initiatives are behind the wellness and tobacco cessation programs. So our physicians can refer their patients into the cessation services that that we, an employer, offer to the employees. And assisting physicians in systematically linking to smoking quit lines. That's kind of links into the first bullet, but making sure that everybody's on the same page, you're speaking as one organization with the health care in mind of your population. So look at some trends, something interesting to note. If you look at my chart here, in 2013, we asked for people to self-report if they were tobacco users. Well, whopping 16 people decided that they would say that they are tobacco users, so they self-reported. So we had a bi-weekly surcharge of $50, and that netted us a, a $21,000. So we promptly realized that that was something that we need to start doing some testing. So the testing then commenced for 2014, and then lo and behold, 235 people were then um, verified tobacco users. Uh, we kept the same surcharge at $50 a year and then netted $305,000. That uh, that revenue, and I'll go into a little bit more, is extremely important for the health plan and also for the wellness programming of the organization. Um, we drove those 235 people to a lot of those things that I talked about before, the um, the station options, 
the grouping, the counseling. Um, we did have a, a number of them say they are now uh, not tobacco users or they have tested as being negative now. So for 2015, and um, we had 180 people, but we increased the surcharge. That was another piece. So again, hitting them right where the money talks, going up to $60 biweekly. Um, again, still $281,000 in 2015. Um, so it is uh, what we've been able to use uh, for our wellness programming, and um, it's a big uh, driver for us. Uh, as an example for surcharge options, all employees uh, must test for cotinine upon hire. This is the Adventist Healthcare case study I'm going to give you. This may or may not uh, be uh, uh, what is working in your state, but I'll give you this as a real-life situation. Um, if positive, the employees will then pay $60 per paycheck uh, tobacco search. Now, this is 2015 because now uh, new employees coming on board will not be able to come on board if they are a, a tobacco user. They will have to quit and then show that they are um, cotinine negative. So this is all cotinine testing. Um, and then to stop the surcharge, the employees may either retest for cotinine and receive a negative result or one of the many cessation programs that are optional to them. They do not need to have shown that they quit. Part of what the, the law is is that they just have to go and complete the cessation program. By completing the program, that gets them all the way, um, and then they, they receive a completion certificate, whether or not they quit or not. We want them to continue on those programs um, if they need to, but after that, uh, if they have a negative result, they never have to be tested again. If they complete cessation program but are still smoking, that cessation that will then um, relieve the surcharge for 12 months, and then they have to retest or go through another program. And again, mentioned before, the 2016 policy of Adventist Healthcare is um, the hiring policy. So, so do with the surcharge money. This is something that is, you know, great, let's do this, but now really make this part of what you do for your employees. Um, and is, this is where you can reinvest in them. And if they know what's going on and you're clear in the communication, they will they will follow you, not just think that, oh, boy, here comes my employer trying to do another program for me and try to charge me money for no reason. You want to make sure that this is real. And they see things like challenges. Maybe you um, bring in... Uh, you do a walking challenge. It may have absolutely nothing to do with tobacco cessation, but you're really getting them involved. The other thing is incentive. What prizes can you um, offer? And this could be an, a prize or incentive offered for that wa that walking challenge. Um, I've seen uh, many, many companies offer Fitbits to their employees as the incentive for completing or even enrolling into a walking challenge, for example. Um, <clears throat> On-site activities. So you want to bring on a seminar or your employees to be able to teach them about maybe work-life balance or financial fitness or anything that can help them um, really engage with somebody on site, step away from the desk for 45 minutes to an hour, and really think about how they can make their lives better. Um, the options. So may go to your vending um, and think about can you get two to three, four lines of your vending machine, all filled with healthy options and not just the bad options. The vending uh, vendors also can give you data on what is uh, consumed most frequently, though, as well. Uh, wellness coaching. So wellness coaching does have a cost that comes to it. You have the coaches, the clinical team. Um, so investing in them and really high-quality coaches to make sure that they're not just available for tobacco cessation, but what if an employee wants to learn how to drive K? They want to get better at just getting active. Well, connect them with a wellness coach who can help them begin physical activity in a, in a healthy way or learn how to make healthy recipes for their family. Um, wellness coaching can take on an enormous uh, book of topics that you can offer for them. And finally, one thing that's really starting to get a lot of popularity is risk stratification and targeted data-driven programs. Now, this is where um, you know, it gets a lot deeper into uh, than just surface-type um, throwing throwing a dart at no dartboard. Now we're really going to throw a dart at a dartboard. So, um, sorry, I'm going to skip ahead. Oops, my system is going back. Apologies. This way. So if we take your population, and would stratify them into good standing, secondary, or high risk. We'd be able to help 
your, you drive specific programs or you can drive specific programs knowing what the risks are of your population. You can do this a couple of ways. You can do a health risk assessment, which is about a 10 to 15 minute questionnaire. You can um, ask your claims provider to give you a breakdown of the uh, aggregate health concerns of your population, and then you might know, oh, wow, I really, really need to work on cardiovascular disease with my population. I can tell you a big one right now is diabetes. So taking the tobacco surcharge money, putting it in a directed uh, program. An example of an incentive management uh, uh, program that involves nicotine. So um, I say nicotine either, even though it's cotinine testing. So for this particular employer, they want their employees to do proactive personal health management, things like mammograms and um, colonoscopies, things that make sure that they get tested regularly to make sure that they stay on top of their health concerns. Um, and then personal wellness profile, which is what we at LifeWork Strategies uh, refer to as the health risk assessment. So we, we call it a personal wellness profile, same exact thing, NCQA certified questionnaire to make sure that we can understand the risks of the population, all self-reported on that. And then there comes, and for this particular employee, it's nicotine. So we'll do a cotinine test on site with the employees, and if they achieve a negative nicotine test, uh, coat test, excuse me, they get one point. If not get that point, they must go through a cessation program, whether it's counseling or a quit line or a group program. If they don't get that point, they're not going to max out all of the possibilities, and then they will not be eligible for that health plan incentive, whatever the employer might decide. So the life example of someplace, someplace other than us. An example of how counseling can be so effective, this is my last slide here, um, in addition to your programming, notice that productivity has been improved, um, the feeling of the experience of positive well, overall well-being is um, improved. Um, it's really important that your counseling and the, and the type of it and the quality is so uh, high that you can be able to really affect people's lives um, that may have come because of tobacco, um, and you're able to then get productivity soar for your organization. Excellent. That was real information. Uh, we do have a few questions that uh, have been submitted, and let me throw them out there, and maybe between the two of us we can answer that. Okay. Have you um, had anybody, you know, claim when they tested positive that uh, they weren't actually smoking, but they were exposed to, you know, secondhand smoke? Is that an issue with you? Okay, we might get that, but what we will do is we say that they can test again, and that test and be at their cost. If the test does come back negative for the second time, we'll reimburse them for the fee of that second cost, that okay. second test. Yeah, one of the things, I, I saw the question, so I looked up the uh, frequently asked question brochure that Orisher has, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, at the cost levels that, um, that they use for their particular lab-based testing program, which I mentioned was 30 nanograms per milliliter, um, they have no evidence that secondhand smoke will trigger a positive result. Usually it will be at a much higher cut level. But um, the, the perspective of somebody who claims that happens sometimes with people who test positive for marijuana, they'll claim that it was secondhand smoke um, that they were exposed to. But typically at the cut levels that most uh, laboratories would use, either for cotinine testing or, you know, in the case of marijuana, you're not going to get a positive uh, from second half smoke, there's just not enough exposure. And the challenge, of course, in making that claim when it comes to cotinine testing is that, um, you know, the the level of nicotine that enters the system from secondhand smoke is minimal. Therefore, the the metabolic breakdown into cotinine would be, you know, negligible. It wouldn't it wouldn't show up in most tests. So now, uh, this is a question very, very specific to Alaska. And um, it said, uh, Ms. Partition, maybe cover this. Is it legal in Alaska to discriminate against smokers during the hiring process? Um, maybe rather than, and, and let me know the answer to that, Mindy, maybe you could address it more from the states where you do business. The Alaska specific um, law, I, I would love to have a client in Alaska, but I don't. <laughs> um, 
Um, but most of the clients that I have are regional um, to the um, D.C., Virginia area. I have um, noticed that things are kind of changing. They're a little bit um, – most most just don't want to go there yet with the with hiring smoker hiring process, um, but at least with Maryland we can. So. Okay. So not a, 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 not a legal obstacle in the state of Maryland. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. What I I didn't find a direct answer to that for Alaska, but I did find I did confirm that Alaska doesn't have a law that prohibits testing. Uh, for nicotine or for coating, like you find in South Carolina. So uh, we can, we can uh, to the person who submitted that question, uh, if you'll just email me afterward at bcurrent at currentconsultinggroup.com, uh, we'll try to find that answer more specifically for you. And, and uh, anything relative to you know discriminating against or or, or not hiring somebody who who tests positive. Um, and if you'll pass the ball back to me for a second. Sure, hint. absolutely. Uh, just sort of a um, new slide. And, and any questions that you have, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A uh, section of the screen in front of you. Uh, any questions that we don't get to today, we will follow up and provide answers to you. Uh, you're going to get slides uh, from the ones that I presented. Me, I don't know if you're if you're able to share your slides or not. I didn't want to speak for you. Um, oh, I just share my slides. Yep, absolutely. Okay. So to our audience, uh, we will make both my slide deck and, and Mindy's slide deck available to you. Um, but you have a lot of statistics. Uh, I really liked Mindy's very specific uh, presentation on what they do and uh, the different types of uh, approaches and programs that they use. We did have somebody uh, send an email saying that they tried to look up the kick butt two point program and they weren't able to find it. I don't know why that is. We'll take a look uh, for it as well. But in slides, you have a lot of information. You're going to get slides. You're also going to have access to the recording of today's presentation. So if you have any additional questions over and beyond what Mindy talked about today, if you have specific program, uh, program implementation questions, uh, and you're in the Virginia, Maryland, D.C. area, please uh, reach out to Mindy on that. Or if you'd like a copy of the Orsher Frequently Asked Questions booklet on coding testing, then we can help you uh, gain access to that. They'll, what they'll do is they'll send you an email, an email with a, P, a link to a PDF uh, document, and you'll, be, you'll have it you know, instantaneously. So with that, I would like to thank my wonderful co-presenter, Mindy Pierce, and um, Thank all of you for joining today's webinar presentation, and we'll turn the mic over to Jessica for information about how to access today's information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill and Mindy. On behalf of Orisher Technologies, we hope that you have found today's presentation informative and helpful. If you asked a question today that was not answered, a representative will contact you to answer your question via email. Any questions that you have relating to today's topic may be submitted to info at currentconsultinggroup.com. That's info at currentconsultinggroup.com. Please subject on Orisher's Cotoning Webinar. This room was recorded, and you will receive instructions informing you how to access the recording. Thank you for your attendance today. This concludes today's webinar.